that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. I've, uh, I've thought about that verse. I wonder if you have too. Did you ever wonder what was left out that we don't get to read about? Or have you ever wondered why we get some of the seemingly obscure accounts of what Jesus did and why those are there over all the things that, it, that John says Jesus did that we don't get to read about. Um, sometimes when we read something that seems obscure, it's not always immediately obvious. But I believe that it's there for a reason. I believe some of those things are there on purpose. It's not an accident. Um, my dad used to say that when you look at artwork or you look at um, a picture of something, nothing there is, is an accident. Everything is very deliberate and everything is on purpose. And, and I feel like the accounts that we have in the New Testament of the things that Jesus did are the same way. I feel like they're there deliberately. They're there on purpose. Even if we, we can't see exactly why it's, why it's there. And I wanted to read one such account today. Let's turn to Matthew 21. And in Matthew 21, we'll read verses 12 to 22. Uh, the context here, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem. They're believing him to be the king. Um, when they lay down the palm branches and cry out, Hosanna, the very next thing that he does is he cleanses the temple, and that's where we'll start. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what thou be say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them, and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Uh, now I read all that just for context for, for what's coming up next. Verse 18 now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, Ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. <clears throat> Have you ever considered Jesus' cursing of the fig tree? It's truly a miracle. It shocked the disciples that it could so quickly die. This is one of those miracles that I've often wondered why it was included in the scriptures. And uh, obviously there's good reason. What did Jesus want us to learn from the cursing of the fig tree? One thing for sure, this is a demonstration of faith. 21 and 22 says, 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. It's definitely a passage on faith, for sure. And I, and I don't want to take away from that this morning. That's, that's not my goal. I want to acknowledge that. This is a passage on faith. Um, however, consider other miracles that Jesus did. He performed miracles usually with one very obvious and tangible element, like somebody is being freed from the bondage of a demon, or they're healed of a handicap. Uh, but oftentimes, he was driving at a much deeper spiritual truth that also used the same miracle to illustrate that truth. For example, the man whose friends lowered him through the roof to receive healing from Jesus. The first thing he did was not to heal the man. The first thing he did was, was to say something that I think even a lot of us would probably, if we didn't recognize who Jesus was, would call blasphemy. That man who was sick on his bed laying on the floor um, was first forgiven of his sins by Jesus. That was the first thing he did. And I, I love the question that he, he asked the doubters. He said, whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And, and when you think about that, um, no man can forgive sins. But it's easy to say to somebody lying sick on the floor that your sins are forgiven you. Anybody can say that, but nobody has authority to say it. But then to prove his authority, he granted the man uh, healing. And he was able to walk away to illustrate that he had the power to forgive sins. Or how about the Syrophoenician woman? Jesus practically humiliated her. However, she persevered and Jesus healed her daughter. He pointed to her perseverance as an example and a model of faith. Or one of my favorites, um, the blind man that Jesus anointed with spit and clay and gave him sight. There's so much to that miracle when you look at it. In John chapter 9, obviously the very tangible miracle was the guy received his sight. He was blind and now he could see. But even more, Jesus used this miracle to illustrate several spiritual principles and just to name a few, for one, it's good and right to do good to men on the Sabbath. The Pharisees were, were after him and were suspicious of this miracle because it was done on the Sabbath. A second thing that he, that he used this miracle to illustrate was that fruit identifies from whence we are, or in other words, our behavior demonstrates whether we're Christ's or not Christ's. Um, and, and one more that comes out of there. Pride causes spiritual blindness. Remember the Pharisees wouldn't even hear what the former blind man had to say, but rather they cast him out of the temple because who was he to teach them? However, a humble seeking heart receives sight into the things of God. Not only did that man receive physical sight, but he also received spiritual sight and was able to receive the truth of who Jesus was. The reason why I go through those examples is just, is just to point out that a lot of times the miracles that Jesus did were multifaceted, and sometimes they carried with them this deep illustration of something spiritual that Jesus was trying to impart to people while he was here. So what about this seemingly small miracle of cursing the fig tree? Is there anything more there? I think it's interesting that this is the only miracle I can think of during Jesus' time on earth in which the miracle he performed directly resulted in death instead of life. And there are some indirect examples we could think of. Um, you know, the, the man, the de, there were two of them, the demoniacs that were, um, that had a legion, and then Legion went into the swine, and the swine ran down the cliff and drowned in the water. Uh, I would say that that's an indirect result of a miracle that Jesus performed, which actually resulted in life for the, the men who were demon-possessed. Uh, 
and I think there may be a, a couple others, possibly, where it was more of an indirect result rather than a direct result of a miracle that Jesus did. I want to read, I want to read this parable, not a parable, I want to read this account again from a slightly different perspective, and it's in Mark chapter 11. Uh, Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 26. And on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily or by chance he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So some time has passed, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedst is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye, forgive, if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Verse 13 is particularly interesting to me. Um, we get a, a pretty... I think it's a significant detail. Jesus was hungry. He came seeking fruit. But he came at a time when nobody expected there to be fruit on that fig tree. It was out of season. For the time of figs was not yet. He was looking for fruit in the off season. Everybody knows that you don't look for fruit in the off-season. But here Jesus did. Consider with me for a moment, this tree had the appearance of a fig tree, but when Jesus approached it, it didn't have the fruit of a fig tree. And I guess my question to all of us this morning is, do we have the fruit of Christianity in every season, or only the appearance of Christianity in every season. Uh, in this account in Mark, at the very end, he tacks on some things that are, I believe, fruits of Christianity. Forgiveness. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. I would say that that's a form of Christian fruit bearing that's important. Fruit bearing is a pretty important theme in Jesus' ministry and throughout all of his teachings. I'm going to read just a few passages. One in Luke chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. 
Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him. This is John the Baptist, by the way, paving the way for Jesus in the ministry that Jesus is going to have. Uh, and here's what John the Baptist said. O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? He answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what? And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chafe he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. John understood the necessity of fruit bearing in those who would seek God. And, and he was paving the way for Jesus to come. Kind of a launch pad, if you will, for Jesus' ministry. There's a short passage in Luke 13 I want to read. Verses 1 through 9. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered, answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after, thou, after that thou shalt cut it down. Um, obviously, the, the end of a tree that produces no fruit is to be cut down. Um, and almost as a side note, I mean... To the original point, if anybody, here's Jesus teaching this parable about a fig tree, right? If anybody understood when a fig tree ought to be in season, it should have been Jesus. He was able to use it in his stories or the parables that he told. Paul echoed Jesus and spoke of different fruits um, and kind of gives a list there in Galatians. Chapter 5, starting in verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, 
as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. It's important for us to shed the works of the flesh and start cultivating the works of the Spirit. And it takes sacrifice. It's hard work. It takes humility, humbleness, repentance, and putting others first. Truly, Paul writes that we must put unfruitful works of the flesh to death by crucifixion. A farmer must take care if he hopes for a fruitful harvest. I'd like to kind of bring it all together with something that Jesus said in Luke. Chapter 12. Verses 35 to 48. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men's servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Jesus is going to come at a time... That we're not looking for him. Obviously the end time season has been now. Since the time of Paul. Until now. And still is. But it's easy to think that we're in the off season. So when he comes. He'll see that we have the appearance of Christians. But will he find fruit among our leaves? Or just leaves. God help us to be found bearing and striving to cultivate fruit in every season because now is the season of imminent harvest. Our faith in our master ought to be full of love and devotion to his teachings and herein can be found we can be found fruitful. So um, God bless you all just Open it up for any comments or move on with a song. Amen, Brother Max. There's so many verses that you brought up that uh, are profound, and I appreciate you 
challenging our mind to so many things. I just com commented one of the, the, the verse that you started out with, brother, was uh, verse 25 of John. And there were many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Um, I guess we have 27 books in the New Testament. We could have had two. It could have been 102. Could have been one verse, Matthew, I'm sorry, Romans 10, 9. Unless you believe in your heart and confess you on your lips, you'll be saved. Some people actually hold on to that. I appreciate how uh, you brought out those points, Brother Max. And, um, the Great Commission said, each have them go teach, baptize, make disciples. Have them believe all that I commanded you. And uh, not just the sermon and the mount or the basics. And um, I guess in John it talks about um, when um, Martha was there with Mary and she was incumbent about washing dishes or, or feeding the people, serving, etc. And Jesus said, um, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the best part and what won't be what was necessary, the only part which is necessary. So I just, what is necessary is to uh, hear the words of Jesus and obey them, as if we didn't know that. And after we've done that, if we ever do it, we still must confess we're unprofitable servants. So we only did what our duty is 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 told. But um, one other comment: it, it was it was written. It could have been what was all the traditions, and but what is written down. And we thank God that we do have the scriptures. Uh, that are written for our instruction. But um, the Lord be magnified. Thank you, brother, for the words that you reminded us of again this morning. The words of our of the coming of our Lord. I think that's talks about him coming as a thief in the night and and we need to be watching and waiting. He could come today. People say he could come any time. And I guess the more I study the scriptures and the more I read that, you know, he could be coming for me today or for you. Or And the more I read the scriptures and look at the scriptures, that's the coming of the Lord. As he comes for me and for you and... He could come any time, very suddenly. We're going down the road or fall over with a heart attack. That might be the coming of the Lord for the person who falls over. So I'm not sure, but that's what I see in the scriptures. So, Lord, Lord bless you. Thank you, brother, <clears throat> for reminding us to bear fruit um, in all seasons. Um, it certainly is uh, a frightening reminder when Jesus talks about uh, when the master of the house returns um, in those different scenarios. We need to be um, carefully examining ourselves and striving to to be the profitable servants. Um, I see in the different kingdom groups um, a lot of uh, um, disunity, <clears throat> I suppose. Uh, even even uh, division. And I wonder... Isn't this kind of what Jesus was talking about when we're beating our fellow servants? <clears throat> um, if we would do more to uh, examine ourselves as closely as we examine others, it's really easy to see the faults of others. They're always evident to us, but our own faults are never evident, evident is, is obviously to us. <clears throat> um, Maybe 
in, uh, just read a little bit from Romans 12. Um, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, and bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. But associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is, is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. To, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. I don't know if I read it, but... Um, maybe I did. But it, it mentions that uh, that we need to... Uh, think more highly of others than we do ourselves, and <clears throat> it's an it's a natural flaw in us to think very highly of ourselves, to be wise in our own mind. And I wonder if we if we focused more on on listening to others and considering the wisdom that they have, that we would be blessed by that and even be more wise I want to just add one little train of thought that I was having <clears throat> I, I appreciate the things that were brought out but <clears throat> as when, when you read the I don't remember which gospel but the second the one in the second one and it had that verse in it like that it it was not he was looking for fruit but it was not the time of figs yet uh, just just thought like how oh like if if this were any other man who had done this we would just we would call it unreasonable uh or let's maybe maybe somebody wouldn't have had the authority to to speak a word to it and curse it. But if any man came to it, any other man came to it, and it wasn't the time of figs, and he didn't find him, and he said, "Cut it down," uh, we we just we just consider that man unreasonable. But because it was Christ, and we have got to know Christ, and and I guess kind of like Peter when when Christ said something that was too deep for him to comprehend his response was where else would we go you have the words of life you've got the authority to say this doesn't matter if I understand it and and with that mind like that's the point where we all need to get to with Christ with that I just recognize like his judgments are fair they're they're just whether we comprehend it or not after all, he was the creator of this fig tree. And with that, I just had to think of like the judgment at the end also. It'll be just, it'll be right. Whether uh, I feel sometimes like people spend too much time um, uh, or or put too much emphasis on convincing others and themselves that they know that they're right with God. They know uh, that He will judge them as, or, or that they will be, you know, if they die right now, that they will go to heaven or, or whatever it is that this assurance is they had rather than just 
leave judgment in the hands of God. And what He does on Judgment Day will be perfect and be right. And what I have to do is serve Him because He's worthy to be served. Glorify Him because He's worthy of all glory and honor Him because He's worthy of all honor. And uh, that's just a, just a train of thought that I was having there. Uh, appreciate the opening.